Gospel of Matthew, the 20th chapter, been a couple of weeks since we've been in Matthew, and I wanted to stay in there as long as I could. I, I know Christmas break, you kind of change things up a little bit. But here's what I have found. I have found that any passage of Scripture is pertinent for any time of the year. It doesn't matter. There's not a bad passage. There, there's not an, a, an incompatible text. So really you can open your Bible and preach anything any time of the year and, and it'd be just fine. It'd be just fine. So I come to Matthew chapter 20. We, we were in it a couple of weeks ago and we uh, looked at um, uh, the passage before what we'll look at this morning and, 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 and I come to the next passage and I almost just skipped over it. But I said, you know, that, that passage right there really, really is what this season is about. Now, when you think of a Christmas passage, you think of Matthew 2, not Matthew 20. But let me read something for you. Matthew chapter 20, and look if you would, in verse number 17. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. If I've ever read a Christmas passage, that is a Christmas passage. Now I know for the next two weeks there is a lot of preaching on the virgin birth of Christ. And that is good. Probably next Sunday we may say, may preach on the virgin birth. I, I, I don't know. But the coming of the Son of God to redeem fallen mankind. That, that's what it's about, right? If it is true that Jesus was born to die, and it is, then it is as appropriate to preach on the death of Christ at Christmas as it is on the birth of Christ at Christmas. So, maybe next week we'll talk about the birth of Christ, but this morning the passage is on the death of Christ. As you move through the Gospels, there is one thing that becomes abundantly clear, and it is that the cross was not a surprise to Christ. Now, we know that it was planned before the foundation of the earth. We, we know that. Uh, the Old Testament prophets, they spoke about it, though they did not understand it. But they prophesied about it. So we know that it was in the mind of God. But did that man, Jesus, did he know as he walked about and ministered for that brief time, did he know that he was headed for a terrible crucifixion on the cross at the end of his ministry? The disciples didn't know it. So did Jesus know it? And the answer is absolutely yes. He, he did know. I, I have an old message. I have preached it a long, long time. Probably never will. On when Jesus knew that it was God. Did he know as a little baby lying in that manger, did that little infant know, I'm the Son of God. I'm the creator of the universe. Well, I don't, I don't believe that he did. The Bible says that he grew in wisdom and knowledge. Uh, did he know as a little toddler, a little two-year-old, a little toddler just learning to walk, did, did he know, did he know at that point that, that, that he was the Son of God and he was here to die on the cross? I, I, I don't believe so. And, and I think if you study that, I think that that revelation came to him, who he was and what his purpose was during those Days when he was 12 years old and he went to the temple and his parents had left him where Joseph and his mother had left him behind for three days. When they came back, they found him in the temple talking to the doctors of law. And do you remember what he told Mary? He said, wished ye not that I must be about my father's business. Now he's not talking about Joseph. The Bible never one time calls Joseph his father because he was it. He's talking about God, his father, and he knew why he was there. He is here to do the father's will and to fulfill all scripture and become the ransom for sin. And I believe it is at that point that Jesus knew that he was the son of God, that he was there as a man to save mankind. So he absolutely knew 
that the cross was up ahead. When he speaks about it to his disciples, there is no fear. There is no trepidation. There is no dread of what is coming. That there is never any hint of any regret. It is very clear. It is very concise. It is very direct. He never asked for sympathy. He never asked to get out of it. He never argues with the Father why it should not be this way. He set his face toward the cross and he marches to his death as a conqueror, not as a victim. Now at this point in the gospel, when you come to Matthew chapter 20, you're only a few months away from it, maybe just a month away from the cross. What ministry that he does from this point on is just on his way toward Jerusalem. Everything is moving toward that final week. The hostility of the elders is, is increasing. His urgency to get to Jerusalem for the Passover is obvious. The people's frenzy to make him the king. It's, it's building to the greatest event in the history of the world. And, 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 and at least on two other occasions, he has sat his disciples down and said, Guys, this is what's going to happen. I need to tell you what is ahead, but it never penetrated their heart. If you hold your finger here, come back to chapter 16. Just a couple of pages, back to chapter 16, and look at verse number 21. Chapter 16, verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That is the first time that the Lord Jesus in very explicit terms tells his disciples that when they get to Jerusalem, he's going to be killed and he's going to raise again the third day. Now you wouldn't believe what happens in the very next verse. Right after that great revelation, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I, I mean, Peter says, Lord, don't worry about it. We're not going to let that happen. He has totally missed it, right? Come to chapter 17. Chapter 17, look at verse 22. While they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. They're sorry to hear it, but I don't know that they believe it. So finally for a third time in our text, Jesus pulls them aside and says, you need to get a hold of this. We are going to Jerusalem and I want you to know that when we get there, that I am going to be crucified, but I will rise again from the dead. Now, I want you just to stop for just a minute, and I want you to think about this. He knew, but he went anyway. He knew, but he went anyway. He knew every detail of what would happen. He lays it out step by step, and still he went. I've often thought, if I could ever know where I was going to die. I just make sure I'd never go there. If I just knew where. I don't need to know when. If I knew where. I just make sure I would just never be in that place. He knew where. He knows. He spells it out. He writes history before it happens. And there are people that have been, they've tried to paint the Lord as a revolutionary, a would-be conqueror who, who got caught up in, in the Roman government and he died a martyr's death before he could actually become the king and overthrow the empire. That, that is absurdly false. It could not be any farther from the truth. It is not an accident. It is not a surprise. It is not a coincidence. It is not a tragedy. He knew, but he went anyway. Oh, that's a blessing to my heart. Blessing to my heart. So I thought, well, this would be a great Christmas text to talk about the death of Christ. And so I want to show you three things about the sufferings of Christ from this passage. First of all, I want you to notice the revelation of his suffering. Look at verse number 18. He says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. The word behold means to get your attention. It means look right here. Listen. Pay attention. 
Don't miss this, all right? This is an exclamation. Don't miss what I'm telling you. Now, the particular part of his ministry is called the Perean ministry. The great Galilean ministry is over. They have actually crossed over to the east side of Palestine, across the Jordan River. They're on the east side of the land. They have gone down the length of the land, and they're going to come, they're going to cross the Jordan River, and they're going to come back up to Jerusalem. From Jericho to Jerusalem, it is always up. They're headed toward Jerusalem. If you'll hold your finger here, Mark gives a parallel passage. Come to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, and, and look at verse number 32, same passage, Mark's rendering of it. Mark 10 verse 32, they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. Jesus went before them, they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve, began to tell them what things should happen unto him. Saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man should be delivered unto the chief priests, and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. They shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. Now, now boy, that's a lot of detail. But notice what, what Mark says in verse 32. He says that they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. They're afraid to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because they knew that the Jewish leaders hated the Lord Jesus. That's where the Jewish leaders are at. They knew the hostility that they would face there. They, they knew the volatility of the scene in Jerusalem. They knew that there was nothing in Jerusalem but hatred and, and contempt for Jesus Christ. And so there is, a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a foreboding in their spirit. In fact, some of them believed that, that they might be killed. Thomas was one of them. We go, but we'll die with you, but we'll go. That's kind of a fatalistic spirit, but that was, that was in them. But, but, but he went anyway. And, and I love the statement in verse 32. They were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And, and I just love this. And Jesus went before them. He led the way. He marched out front. He commanded the troops. He didn't send some ahead to test the waters. To see what it's like in Jerusalem right now. No, no, he didn't do that. He didn't hide his identity so the Jews wouldn't find out who he was. He, he boldly marched in Jerusalem, walked into that temple, turned the money changers over and basically said, here I am, fellas, let's get on with the true business at hand. He went on before them. And I remind you that this has been the plan in the mind of God since the beginning of time. The Bible talks about him being a lamb slain, as it were, before the foundation of the world. Slain in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. So here's what that means. That before Adam ever sinned, God had already provided a lamb. Before there was a sinner, there was a savior. Before there was guilt, there was grace. I, 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 I just, I, I'm getting excited and I try not to be. I'm trying to be dead, but I'm, I can't be. Calvary, Calvary was not an afterthought. It wasn't a last minute addition to the plan of the world. When God made that hill that they later recall Golgotha, when God shaped that hill, he knew. That was the hill that his son would one day die on. What a blessing. All throughout the Old Testament, there are revelations of this great mystery. Zechariah 13 says that he would be forsaken by his friends. Zechariah 11 says that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 22 says that he would be pierced on a cross. It says that his garments would be parted by casting of lots. And Psalm 69 said he would be given vinegar to drink. Man, when you read Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Zechariah chapter 12, man, it's all about the cross. That is the plan. That is the time. That is the schedule. I got an old message. I, I was sitting in the office this morning. Man, I couldn't sleep last night. And so I got, got up at 1.30 just sitting in the office reading and, and just terrible insomnia. But I was thinking this morning about an old, old message. Message I preached years and years ago, maybe 30 years ago, on the doctrine of the Lamb. 
And, and we believe in progressive revelation. Here's what we mean by that. That God doesn't reveal everything about a truth the first time that he reveals the truth. You've got to read the whole of the Bible. There is a scarlet thread that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And when you trace it all the way through, you get the doctrine of the blood. Well, one of the doctrines that is revealed progressively is the doctrine of the Lamb. Now, if you take all of the Bible, you know everything that the Bible says about the Lamb of God. But if you go all the way back to the beginning, where God first mentions the Lamb, He only reveals certain truth about the Lamb. You have to keep reading to get the full, the complete doctrine of the Lamb. I, I love that study. In Genesis chapter 4, there's a story about two brothers named Cain and Abel. It is the first time in your Bible that the Lamb is mentioned. Cain brings an excellent but unacceptable sacrifice. Abel brings a lamb. He simply brings a lamb and God accepts it. There's a lot that you can say about the story, but there are two men that are trying to get to God. Here's what you learn in Genesis chapter 4 is that it requires a lamb to get to God. It requires a lamb to please God. It requires a lamb to approach God. If you're going to get to God, it requires a lamb. Now you don't know anything about the lamb. An old lamb, young lamb. Boy lamb, girl lamb. Does it have to be killed? You don't know anything about the lamb. You just know it is going to require a lamb to get to God. You come to Genesis chapter 22. There's another great passage, passage about a lamb. Abraham has Isaac bound to the altar. He is getting ready to plunge the knife into his heart. And an angel stops him. And he sees a ram caught in a thicket. The emphasis here is it not only requires a lamb to worship God, but God will provide the lamb. Jehovah Jireh, that's what it means. God will provide himself a lamb. You cannot give to God what God requires of you, so God gave it to you. Let's say it again. You can't give to God what it requires, so God gave it to you. I don't know anything about the lamb. I just know that in order to please God, it requires a lamb and God will provide the lamb. You get to Exodus chapter 12. Another great passage on the doctrine of the lamb. The children of Israel are getting ready to cross over, come out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea. It's Passover night. The reason why it's Passover night is because God said, every household take a lamb, slay the lamb, apply the blood on the doorpost. Death angel passes by. And the death angel, when he sees the blood applied to the doorpost, he will pass over you. The emphasis in Exodus chapter 12 is that that lamb must die. Now the lamb died in previous passages, but the emphasis here is that the lamb must die and the blood must be applied. So I have learned from Genesis chapter 4, God requires a lamb. I have learned from Genesis chapter 22, God will provide the lamb. I have learned from Exodus chapter 12, that lamb that God provides will have to die and the blood will have to be applied. You get to the book of Leviticus, especially the first six chapters. And Leviticus deals primarily to the priest for the instructions of the offerings that they are to administer. There are very specific details in those chapters as to what kind of lamb they are to offer. We find out that that sacrificial lamb is to have no scars, no blemishes, no broken bones. In fact, 20 times, here's the statement that you read, without blemish. Without blemish, without, that's the emphasis. It is on the character of the lamb. You can't just pick any lamb. It has to be a spotless lamb. I'm coming to the Bible. I am learning God requires a lamb. I'm learning God's going to provide the lamb. When he does, the lamb's going to die and the blood's going to be applied. But it can't be just any lamb. It has to be a spotless lamb, a lamb without blemish. Then I get to Isaiah. Somebody help me. I get to Isaiah chapter 53. 
53. And in Isaiah 53, I read that great passage, how that he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. Here's the revelation of Isaiah 53. It is that he was oppressed and he was afflicted and he is brought. Now I find out it's not a lamb after all, that the lamb is a person. It is a he. That all of those lambs on that brazen altar really points to the one lamb that would be a person that is to come. Man, I'm learning the doctrine. I come to John chapter 1. Brother Cory John, the Baptist, stands on the banks of the Jordan River, looks down a dusty road, sees him coming and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I know that it takes a Lamb, and I know that God will provide the Lamb, and I know the Lamb's got to die, and the blood has to be applied, and I know it's got to be a perfect Lamb, and it's not a Lamb, it's a person and that's the person he has now been identified. I come to Acts chapter 8. I'm enjoying myself. I come to Acts chapter 8. Philip the evangelist out there in the desert. Here comes the Ethiopian eunuch. Gets on the chariot with him. What are you reading? I'm reading Isaiah 53. Do you understand it? No. Explain it to me. He explains it to him. Preaches to the gospel. Here's what he tells him. Here's what he tells him. And in, in Acts chapter 8, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ, that lamb, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Now, if you have an NIV Bible, don't look for it. They took it out. Don't know why you take that out of your Bible. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That Lamb is Jesus, but now I find out who He is. He is the Christ, the promised Messiah. No, oh, I love that. Hey, I get to 1 Peter chapter 1. If you don't mind, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18. How the redeemed, not redeemed, not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb, of a lamb. And really that's the central passage because he says it's not with corruptible things. Not corruptible things like Cain going back to Genesis 4 but he's foreordained before the foundation of the world. That's the provision of the lamb in Genesis chapter 22 by the precious blood of Christ. Got to be slain. That's Exodus chapter 12. Without blemish and without spot. That's the character Leviticus 1 through 6. Six, the precious blood of Christ, of Christ, that's Isaiah 53, that's Acts chapter 8. But now Peter is going to reveal a new truth about the Lamb because he tells us that the Lamb will not stay dead, but he'll rise again. He says in verse 21 that God raised him from the dead. The resurrection of the Lamb was never disclosed in the Old Testament. That Lamb died and he died and he died and he died, but now, but now the Lamb is resurrected. I don't have time to preach it all, but get to Revelation chapter 5 if you would. There's the Lamb with the scroll in his book. Get to Revelation chapter 22. There's that Lamb reigning on the throne of God as King of kings and Lord of lords. Here's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. I'm trying to tell you that he knew he knew. The Old Testament says it over and over and over and he kept telling, telling the disciples and when he talks about it, he gives so much detail. How does he know exactly what is going to happen? Because only God can tell a story before it begins. Only God can create history before it starts. The revelation of his sufferings. I'll show you a second thing in my text if I may. Not only the revelation of his sufferings, but the reality of his sufferings. The reality of his sufferings. And, and, and I thought about using the word repulsive, but that, that's not going to convey the thought that I want to give. And here's what I mean by the reality. Is that it is something that we should not gloss over. Sometimes, sometimes we, we just pass over the most important things because we've, we're so familiar with them. But any time that you read a passage of the sufferings of Christ, that'll make you stop and think. If you can read the story of the crucifixion in any passage, and it not cause a little wonder in your heart, don't read any farther. Just stop. Go back and read it again. And if it doesn't move you, just stop. Go back and read it again. I'm not looking for new details, but I am looking for fresh wonder at the fact that Jesus Christ suffered for 
my sins. My sins. Look what he says. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes. The upper echelons of Jewish leadership. The holy men in the nation. The religious ones. The experts in the law. These are the men who, who, who enforce the traditions of the rabbis. These are the men that you have to go to to interpret the laws and all of the rules. And Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot sitting right there before him would go to those Jewish leaders and betray him. He knew the man that he called friend and whom he would wash the feet of would sell him for 30 pieces of silver. He says not only that, he says they shall condemn him to death. They're going to arrest me. They're going to bring me before Caiaphas, the high priest. The Sanhedrin is going to be there. They're going to call two false witnesses to testify against me. They are going to denounce me as a blasphemer. They are going to condemn me to die in their Sanhedrin court. It's as if the Lord already knew what they would say. It's as if he already knew the names of the witnesses. It's as if he already knew that they would accuse him of blasphemy. He already knew how corrupt the system would be. He said, they're going to condemn me to death. He says in verse 19, they shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. The Jews didn't have the right of sword. They're under the domain of the Roman Empire. They don't have the permission to execute their own criminals. The Romans reserved the right of the sword just for themselves. So, so they know we have to get the Romans to do our dirty work for us. So, so the Romans will never crucify him for blasphemy. They don't care. So we're going to have to accuse him of a crime the Romans would consider a capital offense. So they accuse him of insurrection. Trumped up charges against the Roman government. They, they try to convince Pilate to condemn him. Both Herod and Pilate are, are both reluctant. They can't find him guilty. But they bow to the demands of an angry mob. Turn him over into the hands of sadistic Roman soldiers. And, and, and they did exactly as Jesus said. They mocked him. And they scourged him. And they crucified him. It's often been said that no man ever suffered as much as Jesus said. No man ever died as horrible a death as he died. And, and I, I've thought about that. What, what, what does that mean? Because he's not the only one to have been crucified. Thousands of men faced the same fate that he faced. Thousands of men were scourged. Thousands of men were crucified. In fact, other men had their legs, legs broken. He didn't. Um, a lot of men have died horrible deaths and horrible tortures. So, so what does it mean? What does it mean that, 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 that no man ever suffered, no man ever died like he died? But the sufferings of Christ wasn't just the physical pain on the cross. It's interesting the word sufferings. Found a number of times in your Bible referring to the, that the word suffering single. It's only found one time. But nearly every time that it talks about the pain of the cross, it talks about the sufferings of Christ. Plural. And I think about Isaiah 53 and verse 3. He's despised, rejected of men. Manasar is acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. not. The, 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 the suffering of rejection. To be despised of men. The, the pain of rejection, to not be shown any dignity, any respect, to, to be hated of all men. The sorrow of being filled with sorrow and grief and getting no respect, no sympathy. And, and imagine, imagine how that would be for somebody who has known nothing but the worship of, of angels for all of existence. It says in verse number 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, the suffering of carrying somebody else's pain. When, when, when your heart grieves over what something somebody else has done. It says in Isaiah 53 in verse 4, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The suffering of having God come against you. We hear that cry from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
It says that he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. The suffering of being oppressed and afflicted, and you cannot speak out on your defense. Never says a word. He never says, hey, wait a minute, I'm the Son of God. You can't treat me like this. Never, never, never a word in his defense. He is right. He is just. He is pure. And all of the insults and all of the lies and all of the blasphemies. He never says a word. Isaiah 53 and verse number 8 says he was taken from prison and from judgment. He was cut off out of the land of the living. The suffering of false judgment. The suffering of no, knowing you have done nothing wrong. And you're going to be punished for it anyway. To know that you do not deserve what is happening to you. You didn't do anything. It, it is just, it, it is incomprehensible how complete his sufferings were. I wrote down this morning, he suffered the pain of disloyalty. The psalmist said that mine own friend in whom I trusted have raised up his heel against me. And it's a messianic prophecy talking about how that Jesus would be, be, be betrayed by a familiar friend. Someone that he had loved. Someone he has spent three and a half years with. Someone he has placed his trust in. And when someone close to you betrays you, that brings a new level of suffering. He suffers the pain of disloyalty. He suffers the pain of rejection. John says that he came into his own and his own received him not. His own brethren in the flesh wouldn't believe him. They wanted him for his miracles. They didn't care for anything else. And even when he's on the cross, the disciples fled for their own safety. The pain of rejection. He suffers the pain of humility. Mock or humiliation. Mockery. Scorning. Ridicule. When he hangs on the cross, he hangs there naked. They stripped all of his garment. That, that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to be exposed to the world. It's embarrassing to be laughed at and to be mocked. He suffers the pain of unjust guilt. Several months ago, I was coming through Georgia, and I, I got pulled over uh, by, by a very nice police officer, and he gave me a speeding ticket. And I didn't get mad at him, and here's the reason why. I was speeding. I was. I deserved the ticket. So now you should get mad at him. Now, I have never been pulled over for somebody else speaking. Right? If I ever got pulled over, all right, and if I ever got pulled over and that officer said, listen, you were doing just fine, but the guy in front of you blew by you and I couldn't catch him. So I'm going to give you the ticket instead of him. We got a problem. Right? Right? I will take my punishment. I'll pay my fine. I've got one right now. I've got to pay. Uh, don't ever run a red light in Milton because they'll take a picture of you and send you a little reminder. And those suckers are expensive. I got one I got to pay. All right? I was, I guess I was driving the truck. I'll, I'll be a man and I'll pay, I'll pay for it. But I don't want to pay for yours. Right? Right? I'll pay for mine. Now, listen, he faces the penalty of sin when he hasn't sinned. He is accused of crimes that he has not done and he's punished by God for something that he has not committed. And here's what I'm trying to say to you. That his sufferings are real. Don't just yawn and pass on by. Don't just open the gifts and forget about it. Let it get down into your soul. Think about what it means. That he suffered for your sin. Notice, if you would, in Matthew 20, I want you to notice a third thing. And this really amazes me. There's the revelation of his sufferings. There's the reality of his sufferings. But I want you to notice the response of his sufferings. Look at verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant thee that, thy, that these my two sons may sit, the one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. I, I just find that absolutely incredible. He has just spoken about his own sufferings. And immediately thereafter, 
to the disciples want to know what kind of position do we get in the kingdom. They completely missed it. It went over there. They, they, all of their thoughts are on themselves and not on him. Now, I don't mean to bust your Christmas bubble. I really don't. But I'll help you. Because that's going to happen a million times. Right? What should they do? They should have wept. Maybe pray. Maybe ask questions. Maybe let's talk about this. But they are so concerned with their own desires, they cannot even grasp what he's saying. And what will happen this year, in the next week and a half, is really a small microcosm of what happens all the time. That people will be so wrapped up in their presence and parties and their toys. Sit down, children. Let's read Luke 2 quickly, quickly. Hurry up. Let's read Luke 2 quickly. we got presents to open. And we will spend 30 seconds on the Christmas story. And we'll completely miss it. Just make sure that I get what I want. Make sure that you know what's on my list. Make sure that I get what I... Well, I'm killing the service. Killing it. Make sure I get what I deserve. I'll tell you the proper response this morning. I'm done. The proper response is to bow your heart to Him and accept Him as your Savior. That's the proper response. The proper response is don't yawn, pass it by, and forget about it. No, the proper response is to realize your own sin and see Him hanging on that cross for you. The proper response is to worship Him and to love Him and to adore Him and to let your heart be filled with wonder and amazement afresh and anew over His sufferings for your guilt. Your guilt. Would you stand with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank You for these three verses, Lord, as You have spoken to Your disciples and for the third time have told them what lies ahead. Lord, we have the advantage of having the complete revelation of Scripture. We look back at the cross from the other side. And we see that everything that you said came true exactly like you said that it would. What a wonder that is. Lord, I pray with all of our being that as we go into this Christmas season, that it's not just about the birth of Christ. It is about the death of Christ. That's really the reason why you came. You came to die for our sins. Would you help us, Lord? Not to go through this thing with selfishness and greed and, and all of those things. But Lord, may our hearts truly be filled with wonder. And as I sat in that office and I read these three verses and could not read any farther, help us, Lord, when we read it just to stop. Just to stop and just to think about what we have read. Thank you for your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Proper response is to worship Him.